So I'm, I think I'm going to put a challenge up to the uh, whoever's doing the uh, subtitles because I'm going to talk really fast. I think if anybody's had a class with me, you know that I'm pretty. Uh, I, I try to cram a lot in. I want to give you your money's worth. So you know, please pay attention. Put the text away because you know if you blink, you might miss something. So I got like 250 slides. I'm going to try and go through. I put a lot of stuff in there so that if you want the slides and you want the footnotes and you want the sources, you know, I can provide them. But one of the messages that I like to give to all my MBA students is that you're not an expert in anything. Look, there are experts out there. Okay, your job is to understand how to interpret the experts and how to query the experts. And so as a generalist, and you guys are generalists, and I'm a generalist, we might wonder what the heck can a generalist offer to something as complicated as the coronavirus crisis? Okay, and, and I think that uh, that's a challenge that I, I decided I wanted to take on. And I think it's a challenge that you all need to take on because all of us have to decide how, how we're gonna live our lives and who to listen to, who to trust and how to make decisions. Okay, so just a bit about me. I have, of course, I'm not an epidemiologist and I'm not a, uh, uh, a um, uh, you know, a um, uh, infectious disease expert. So we gotta, we gotta take everything I say with like, hey, I'm an amateur like you trying to make sense of the facts. Okay, so um, I think that every aspect of business school can play a role in helping you to understand the material. So I'm gonna go through and talk about strategy and economics and operations and data and decisions and all those classes you took and how they can give you kind of insight into what's happening in the world around us. So just a bit about me, if you don't know me, I teach here at Berkeley, I teach at uh, Achasse Paris as well. I teach, I've been at some other schools. I'm now teaching also at Stanford. Here are some companies I've worked with. And my favorite class, of course, uh, that I teach a lot is strategy. And so, you know, what can strategy uh, tell us about this, this coronavirus? Like if you're gonna manage this crisis as a policymaker, as a leader of a company or a leader of a family, right? What can strategy tell you? Well, one of the things is that strategy, if done correctly, involves a lot of scenario planning. And I think a lot of people have been critical of our, our policymakers for failing to foresee right, this crisis. And I talk to a lot of financial advisors, I talk to a lot of asset managers, and, and they talk about this thing as if it is a black swan, right? Particularly back last February and March when their asset portfolios were hit in, in a major way, okay? And so everyone was like, oh my gosh, this pandemic, oh my gosh, this crisis, it's crazy. Markets lost a huge amount of value, okay? And so lots of unemployment, uh, lots of suffering, which we'll get into, uh, related to the, the, uh, the virus and also to the mitigation efforts against the virus. Uh, and so some people said this was a surprise, but others say, no, this is something that we should have expected and we should have, have planned for, okay? And I, when I advise these uh, portfolio managers, I, I, I ask them to do this kind of scenario planning and think about the likelihood of these sorts of, of shocks. So was this a, a black swan event or is this something that you need to bake into your models? Well, as an historian, okay, I, I like to think that, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. Like we've been through all this before, right? You know, we did have this thing called the Black Death back in the 1340s. Now you wanna talk about, you wanna talk about a crisis. <laughs> you wanna talk about a pandemic. Now that is a pandemic, right? Pretty serious, um, you know, and then of course the plague, the bubonic plague persisted in England and other countries. You know, here in the United States, we had things like yellow fever. I mean, I'm from the city of Philadelphia uh, the entire city, if they could afford to, just decamped outside of the city because it was just a, a swamp full of, of disease-bearing uh, mosquitoes. We had to move the entire capital of the country kind of out into the suburbs. Okay, so this is something that we've seen before. And of course, the 1918 flu, which now everybody knows about. But remember, we had a centennial of this flu right before the pandemic. And so there were a lot of books that were written about this. I read a whole bunch of them because I'm fascinated with uh, infectious diseases. Okay, so this thing happened, this is from The Economist of 2018, right? So this is two years, three years ago, and it was featured on the cover of, of The Economist. Okay, and then of course, there's been these books, Coming Plague, Spillover, Next Pandemic, right? Okay, these things were all released. And you know, if you follow the literature, you know, and it wasn't just foreseen by these folks, it was even foreseen by that guy, Nostradamus back in 1555, if you wanna get a little old school on, on the prophecies. Okay, but then of course we got Bill Gates, who's the modern Nostradamus, he's saying this, uh, and you know all sorts of other people in the Obama administration had laid down plans uh, to prepare us for this. Okay, so if this is if this is really if we're all prepared for this, then kind of why is we why is everything so messed up? 
Okay, and I think part of it is because as we say in strategy, everybody fights the last war. We had a plan in place, right? We had a plan in place, but that plan was designed for a pandemic that had slightly different features. Okay, so Ebola, we managed to corral Ebola. Now Ebola is a nasty, nasty virus, and yet we managed to corral it. We managed to make it go extinct, right? Remember MERS, MERS, we more or less took care of MERS. And of course, the one I think that is the most analogous to what we see here is the original SARS, right? Remember this SARS is a sequel. There was an original and in the original, uh, we actually managed to do a fantastic job of corralling this thing back in 2003. I think most people don't even remember it because so few people actually died, right? And what happened was uh, the original source was identified, okay? And then before it had a chance to kill too many people, we were able to track and trace it all around the world, okay, identify all the little pockets, most of which were in hospitals, and we did contact tracing and isolation, okay? This was the gold standard for containing an infection. So what went wrong? And I think a lot of people are very critical of the, the authorities for failing to do this quickly enough. And maybe there was a moment where it was doable, but that moment slipped very, very quickly. And certainly by the time the virus was discovered in the United States, I would argue it was far too late because of the nature of this virus. Okay, so in order for us to understand how to get rid of a virus, we have to think about things from the virus point of view. So I teach it in strategy. I say strategy is when you're trying to achieve a goal in the presence of others who have goals of their own. Okay, now, Normally, this refers only to sports and business and war and not to like natural phenomenon, but these natural phenomena, they have a goal, they have a purpose, or at least we can talk as if they have a purpose. Okay, of course, it's just inert DNA or RNA, it's just, you know, inert matter, but that inert matter, we can view it as having a goal or a purpose, which is to proliferate as far and wide as possible to create as many copies of itself as possible possible. Now, look, there are a couple different ways to do this, right? Uh, and one way, of course, is to be highly, highly, highly virulent. Now, the thing is, if you're highly, highly, highly virulent, then you often will kill your, your host. So you can't be too virulent. Otherwise, you won't be able to make it from host to host unless you're, you're vector born like cholera or, or malaria. Okay, so a lot of what we've been trying to do to outsmart this virus is based on understanding the virus's dynamics. And so coronavirus is, is a little bit different from these other viruses that we've been tackling. If you look at it on the kind of infectiousness and deadliness axis, you see that there's actually a bit of a trade-off here. I mean, except for vector-borne diseases, you, you have a trade-off. And so over time, most of these viruses, right, have a tendency Oh, oh, where's my little animation? They have a tendency to become uh, slightly less deadly in exchange for having more infectiousness. Okay, and but we've actually seen that happen in, in coronavirus in the very short time in which it has been evolving. Some people think new strains are, are more deadly uh, and that's up for debate. They're certainly more, more infectious, okay? And so if we compare it to these other viruses, it's actually quite different from H1N1 and others. And that means that the strategy that we had for containing it uh, was not the appropriate strategy. And that's why we're looking at these alternatives. Okay, and so the key thing about this, this virus, uh, the key kind of strate strategy that it uses, which is super, super clever, uh, is this asymptomatic infectiousness. Right, so with Ebola, for instance, you're not infectious unless you are right actually leaking bodily fluids in a major way, and the only way for others to get infected is to come in contact with those those bodily fluids. Okay, whereas of course with coronavirus, you can be asymptomatic and you can be infecting people at a distance. Okay, so this is a super super clever strategy on the part of of this coronavirus which means that it's very difficult to identify people who are infected unless you are doing testing, right, in a, in, in a very, very aggressive way. Now, we'll talk about testing later, but of course, one of the biggest challenges with PCR testing is that it is extremely expensive, okay, and 
the, the time that it takes to deliver a result is, is very lengthy, okay? And that's the reason why we've chosen to do social distancing as a way of impeding transmission as opposed to right, track and trace, which people still say, hey, if we could only track and trace, we could you know, kill this thing, but it's simply not a cost-effective or realistic uh, option uh, in a country like the United States with the level of infections that we have. Okay, and so the, the, when we talk about contagiousness, you guys have all getting, gotten an education in the last couple months on things like you know, R-naught, right? And uh, IFRs, infection fatality rates, uh, right? And case fatality rates and so forth. So just to review, because this helps us understand you know, how we're going to defeat this thing, right? R-naught is the statistic which captures how many people each individual will infect, right? And if this number is greater than one, then the prevalence will increase. If this number is less than one, then the prevalence will, will decrease. Now, of course, it doesn't go to zero in many cases because it all depends on the gestation period and so forth. It can get very, very low, but it doesn't necessarily go to zero. It can kind of bounce around in, in different reservoirs and pockets from, from time to time, okay? But the goal of most of our strategies is to get that R naught down. So the R naught is not something which is fixed. It is variable and it's a function of how we behave, how we interact, right? How we dress, et cetera, okay? So a lot of people think of this as a fixed number, right? It's some inherent property, but it really depends on the society. So the same exact virus could have a different R naught, say in Sweden, where most people live by themselves and uh, the slums of Mumbai, where, where most people live, you know, cheek and jowl, okay? So there's no uniform R naught across societies. There's also no uniform R naught across uh, individuals, because if you're young, Okay, you know, you don't catch it if you're, if you're in, an infant or a young child, you, you, you don't catch it. The attack rate is very low. Uh, and so, uh, you know, if you have it and you're surrounded by young children, very few of them will catch it from you. So the R naught would be low. If you walk into a nursing home, right, uh, with an infection that's contagious, your R naught will be very, very high because they're, they're more vulnerable. Okay, so this number, you know, which, which everyone talks about is actually something that, that is subject to uh, quite a few uh, variables which, which can influence it, okay? Similarly, right, if, if you are someone who is very popular, if you are, you know, the, the, the life of the party, you know, you're the person who has all the friends, your r not is gonna be much higher than if you're the loner who lives in, in, in the basement, okay? So, uh, so you don't know r not is a function of the number of people that you interact with times the intensity of that interaction times their, their vulnerability and so forth, okay? So everyone wants a nice simple number that they can play with, but those things are uh, have exogenous and endogenous features which cause it to go, go up or down. But you can see that when you have geometric growth of something, you know, very, very small differences in that R naught can lead to dramatic changes. And that's one of the things that we learned, of course, in our quant classes is how to deal with exponential changes. Most human beings are not very good at dealing with exponential. Okay, the other model that we learned is this thing called the SIR model, which is that everybody in the population is either susceptible, infected, or immune at any one point in time. Now, one of the things that, that most people fail to appreciate is that the number of people who are actually infected at any given time is, is actually quite low, right? It's quite low in the United States over the course of this disease cycle. Okay, and infectious, is not the same as infected, right? Infected is a definite, you, you can vary the definition. Do you have traces of RNA in your you know, bloodstream, okay? Or in your nasal cavity? Okay, that you might classify as infected. Others would say you're not infected because you're not necessarily infectious, okay? So we have to distinguish between those two. And then ultimately, after you pass through this thing, you become uh, immune. Now, now, one of the things that, that most people uh, don't talk about is that while you are infectious, you are the source of a negative externality, right? Meaning that you uh, are imposing costs on other people, right? As if you were, you know, smoking, uh, you're, you're exuding all of this toxic stuff. But what most people fail to uh, understand is the corollary, which is that if you are immune, then you are producing positive externalities. 
right? Because you are yourself a speed bump to the transmission, okay? And very early on in this crisis, we decided as a policy decision to not track who is immune, right? The concept of immunity passports came up. It was rejected for political reasons and for you know cultural reasons, uh, policy reasons, okay? But the idea that people are in fact harmless once they are recovered from this infection is something which we have downplayed, but I believe is something that we should have taken very seriously as we did in almost every other pandemic, right? So in New Orleans, there were people who had gone through, right, uh, yellow fever, and they were known to be recovered, right? Uh, in the concentration camps, there were people who had recovered from typhus, okay? And everyone knew who was recovered and who wasn't, okay? And those people worked in, in the, in the, you know, what, what went for hospitals in those, in, you know, in those conditions, which were, you know, not much of, a, of an improvement. But still, people track this stuff. We, we've not, we have not tracked it. And I know people who work in, in nursing homes and because they, they don't, they, they track, they, to the extent that they track it, they actually do not allow recovered people, they do not allow recovered people to work with vulnerable people, right? Which is the exact opposite of what you would want. You would wanna have the uh, recovered people put in positions where they are surrounded by, by vulnerable people. Okay, so this is the, the SIR model, which is of course, forms the basis for the, the herd immunity models that we all know about now. And of course, there's two different ways you can become recovered. The, the much better way to become recovered is through a vaccine, obviously. And you don't have to go through the more painful vaccination process of, of an infection. Okay, and so this is the idea. You're, you wanna create these roadblocks or speed bumps to the dissemination of, of the virus. And you know, there's a quantitative model here which tells you how much of the population has to be recovered in order for this R naught to decline uh, to a significant level where the virus stops stops growing. We want R naught to be below zero. So if we start with our, you know, R naught uh, at the very beginning of the virus, and then that R naught is going to essentially decline because of the speed bumps that we we run into. Okay, uh, and so we can calculate this threshold. And so a lot of talk uh, in the early days of 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 COVID. Uh, thought that the threshold might be as high as 80%, given, given what we knew about the infectiousness, okay? Um, and that would mean we could return back to normal life. Of course, if we stay in a lockdown type environment with social distancing, then we would not need nearly as, as much in the way of prevalence to get to that point. Okay, and so this is sort of some of the thresholds that we see. Uh, and you can see the higher the R naught, like with measles, which is very, very high, you, you have a very, very high threshold because it's so damn infectious, okay? Okay, and so there's been a lot of interesting work on this, which is all, you know, only kind of came to the fore somewhat late in the cycle, which is that you know, when you have a model, and you know, when I teach financial modeling to financial engineers, we, we like to assume a normal curve. We like to make these assumptions because our models are more tractable, but they're less realistic. When you make a more complicated model, which is more, more realistic, such as introducing heterogeneity of networks into the population, then the threshold can be considerably lower, right? You know, and a lot of people have suggested that for one vaccination strategy was to vaccinate the most popular people uh, as opposed to the least popular people. Now that, that's, I would say, ceteris paribus, holding constant their vulnerability, that actually makes quite a bit of sense but vulnerability should probably trump popularity. Again, we could figure out what that trade-off is because after all, we took economics and so we understand how to do, do trade-offs, okay? And so, you know, right now, I think a lot of us are, uh, we, we're already seeing a substantial decline in infections uh, because of the, uh, the, the distribution of vaccines, but also don't forget the existing immunity, which the CDC estimates to be north of 40% of the population. We're gonna get into that a bit later, okay? Uh, and of course, you know, this will change based on the different variants and, and so forth. So the example that I've always thought of since the very beginning of this crisis was, you know, I think about forest fires. One of the things we do in, in business school is we look for analogies, okay? So whether it's floods or fires, right? Some kind of massive, you know, shock to the system and we have to deal with it. So forest fires have been in our mind, you know, the last couple of years here in California. And so, you know, when there's a forest fire, 
um, there's a couple different ways to deal with it. Now, look, there's ways to prevent it, such as, you know, uh, maintaining the forest and so forth. But, you know, once you have a forest fire, there are a couple different strategies that you can take. Okay. And of course, there's the option one, which is to try and put out the fire. Okay. Just try to put out the fire. All right. Now that's option one. And then there's option two, which is just do nothing and just, you know, let it burn and die. And, you know, most of the debate that we've had for the last year and a half or so has been around these two options, right? Uh, you know, the people who are advocating so-called herd immunity, you know, were seen as the let it rip school and, and the folks who uh, were doing, you know, containment, track and trace isolation, you know, were seen as the, you know, uh, put it out school, all right? But in fact, as we know in strategy, there's always a choice space which, which can be enlarged if you think creatively, okay? And so, you know, we've been told, of course, to keep calm and, and follow uh, the science. And so the science of, you know, forest putting outing, you know, says that there are a bunch of different other intermediate options. Okay. And so, you know, as an economist, right, which is all, we are all amateur economists, you know, this is the model that we've, we've learned, which is, um, you know, there's a trade-off between things like health and wealth. And this is how the debate was phrased last March. It's like the let it rip school, they care about the economy and they want the GNP, right? And the uh, health school is like, just who cares about the economy? If it costs $25 million to save, you know, grandma, we're gonna spend, you know, that kind of money because life is precious and life is, is priceless, okay? And so these two kind of caricatures have dominated the discussion, right? Uh, and, you know, as an economist, you can't say the scientists decide this because scientists can, can never tell you what your objective is. They can only tell you what your options are. They can never tell you what your objective is. Okay, that, if you expect science to tell you why you ought to get out of bed in the morning, if you expect science to tell you like what, you know, uh, what you how, how many drinks you should have, it can, all they can do is tell you, you know, if you smoke, you're gonna, you're gonna probably die of lung cancer or something, but it, can't tell you whether you, you know, should enjoy the pleasure of the cigarette more or less than the pleasure of a longer life. That is not a scientific decision. Ultimately, that is a policy decision. That's something that we as a society have to decide. You as an individual have to decide. You as an employer or family head of household have to decide. Okay. And so ultimately, this is, you know, what we learn in economics is to explore trade-offs, articulate trade-offs to help us make the decisions that we want to pursue our goals. Now, I would argue that we as a society never actually had this conversation and we never actually decided what our goal was. Was our goal to minimize deaths? Was our goal to minimize COVID deaths? Was our goal to minimize COVID deaths this month? Was our goal to minimize number cost per life saved, cost per year of life purchased? We never came to a consensus over what we wanted, and because we didn't have this consensus, that I think has led to an awful lot of, of, of confusion with people talking past one another. And so when we're trying to figure out, you know, what is the right choice on this frontier, the answer, of course, as we all know, and I've got this button from my students, they gave it to me because I say it so often, it depends, it depends right? It depends. It depends on, right, our society's preference. How much do we value things? And at the end of the day, right? If you're India, you're going to make a different choice than if the United States, right? We have, right, a value of human life here in the U.S. government, right? It's, it's used by most of the departments, which is somewhere around eight to ten million dollars per life, okay? If you take that eight to ten million dollar per life and you, you map it into India, okay, you simply, you know, you will run out of money before you've even made a dent, okay? You cannot use a one size fits all rule across all, all contexts, okay? And so, you know, we can question the, 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 the value of a statistical life. I, I think it's, it's, a, it's something which, you know, we need to have much more debate on, you know, and the literature uses a small, different number for small changes versus large changes. You know, quality is another metric, which is quality adjusted life years, right? Which is very different from, you know, the value of a single life Right? If you extend someone's life, because 
Ultimately, an economist would argue there's no such thing as saving a life. There's only extending a life. And there's no such thing as killing someone. There's only shortening a life. Okay, life is a, a quantity that you have. There's, you know, the economist speaking. Okay, and it's the area under the curve maybe that you're trying to maximize. And that is not a life. It's you're dead or alive. Yes, tr that's true. But the idea of saving a life or not saving a life is, is, makes no sense to an economist. It simply is incoherent. Okay, so Josh Gans has written some really interesting stuff. He's an economist at University of Toronto. And, and he says that this, you know, when we look at the technologies uh, available to us in this pandemic, we don't actually have a smooth production possibility frontier. We actually have some discontinuities. We have some increasing returns. And, and that means that, you know, our, our choice set is, is limited. Right, we, we really only have two sweet spots in this curve. One which involves a, a major effort to contain the virus and another which is to kind of let it more or less flow. Okay, this is how we've more or less boxed ourselves in to these two, two different options. Okay, and that means that once you deviate from one of these peaks, then you might as well go all the way to the other peak. Okay, so the argument he makes is that, you know, if you, uh, sacrifice health uh, and, and allow people to, to kind of move around uh, and, and resume normal life, then, you know, it, it probably makes sense to go all the way, right? Potentially, right? Or if we can somehow, uh, you know, uh, engage in sort of macro policies, those macro policies can, can push out the frontier. So we can play around with this frontier, uh, try to push it out, try to figure out some places in the middle. And so when it comes to forest fires, right, if we extend our strategy set a little bit, one option is not to put out the fire, but simply contain it until the rains come. Okay, contain it until the rains come, which means, hey, let's just keep this thing kind of on a low boil until the vaccines arrive. Okay, and that is essentially a, a third strategy. Okay, a fourth strategy is to kind of water down all the dry tender, water down all the dry tender. So if we see the fire coming at us, then what actions can we take to make sure that that fire is, is harmless, right? Are there interventions that we can make that will reduce the, the gravity of this, this fire so that the fire kind of turns into a low kind of, you know, smoky thing instead of a blazing thing, right? So can we water down the, the, the dry tinder here so that it's not so dry, okay? And this is something that we haven't talked about, right? And, and I'll talk about if I have time towards the end, you know, I think that our public health officials should have been standing up in March telling everybody, hey, here are some simple things that you can do to increase the likelihood that you'll survive this pandemic, right? If you catch this virus, okay, if you catch this virus, here are ways that you can bolster your system so that you can survive this thing. Okay, I don't think anybody's really been talking about that. That's something that's another strategy. Okay, then there's what we call the fire breaks. And a fire break is basically saying, okay, that part of the forest, that's done. Okay, this is like a strategic retreat. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna wall off the parts that we don't wanna burn. We're gonna build a fire break around our house. We're gonna build a fire break around uh, the most valuable real estate. And then the cheap real estate, we're just going to let that stuff burn because, you know, we don't really, it's not, it's not doing much damage to burn down some, you know, someone's lawn, but it does do a lot of damage to burn down their house. So let's build a, a fire break. Okay. Uh, and, you know, this is a strategy which for some reason people haven't really, you know, uh, warmed up to, which is, is to me like really surprising because in economics, we learn that there's low hanging fruit and high hanging fruit. We learn that there's a marginal return to our dollars spent. And if there's a high return, then you spend that. And if it's a low return, you wait until after and see if you have any money left over. I don't think that we as a society have rank ordered our expenditures. You know, we've spent about, according to Larry Summers, about $8 trillion on this, on this crisis. And I don't think that we've calculated the ROI on that expenditure. Okay, a fire break is one way to think about it. Okay, and then, of course, in the world of forest fires, we have what's called uh, controlled burns. A controlled burn is when you actually go out and you burn part of the forest 
in order to make the fire less damaging. So there's a famous story about a uh, forest fighter up in Idaho, very famous fire, and he realized that he could not escape the fire. So he lit a little fire and then lay down and the fire went over him. Okay, very counterintuitive, but very effective. Okay, what would be a controlled burn in this case? A controlled burn is something that no one seriously considered, which is to intentionally infect people, right, who uh, are um, unlikely to get sick. Okay, unlikely to have serious consequences. This is something, you know, to create that fire break, to actually create a wall, a human wall of immune people to protect those people who are most vulnerable. This is something which was never seriously considered. To me, it's, it's absolutely puzzling. I don't understand it. We talk about medical ethics, but we, we do things in wartime that are, that are uh, far more, uh, far more uh, aggressive than, than this. Uh, and we've had you know, hundreds of thousands of volunteers who would gladly uh, you know, put themselves in, in this position. And yet we, we've refused to even consider it, which to me is, is, is interesting uh, as a, as a, as a, as a, as from a sociological point of view. Okay, uh, and so, you know, I think what happened was in last February and March, we saw it was happening in Wuhan. We saw it was happening in Italy. We saw it was happening in New York. And so uh, we realized, oh crap, our hospitals can't handle this sort of thing. And so that's when our operational mindset kicked in. That's when we started thinking about things like capacity utilization, right? Which I teach a lot in my classes, okay? And we, we you know, over the years, we have run a hospital system in an extremely lean manner. Now, of course, it's hard to see with all the expenditure, but we, you know, the goal is to have as little excess capacity as possible. And so we've trimmed out a lot of our capacity, which made us unprepared for a massive surge in, in demand, okay? So operations tells us if you have limited capacity, then you probably wanna smooth your production out over the year. I actually have a case that I use in one of my classes where it's a company that makes Christmas products and they switch from producing all their goods in early December to producing it over the course of the year. And uh, the inventory cost is offset by the, the, the excess capacity costs that are eliminated, okay? So this is how our operational mindset kicked in and we decided to flatten the curve. Now, the original idea behind flattening the curve was not to actually reduce the number of infections, but to reduce the, the number of infections in the current period and then kick them out to a later period, okay? And, and so, you know, generally things that are negative, you want them to happen later, okay? But I think there was more to it than that, which is that if we can somehow smooth it, then we can increase the survival probability, okay? Now, this was built on, on the belief that this was built on the belief, and there's some data to support this, right? That if you have a very intense uh, infectious period, the, the mortality rates will be higher. And so this is why we have stay from home orders, okay? Um, but the corresponding piece is that if we believe, if we believe that access to healthcare improves your, your outcome, then we should simultaneously be increasing the, the amount of capacity. Now, this piece we didn't actually do. We didn't actually increase our capacity by that much, right? Instead, once we started flattening the curve, we were like, hey, this is great. Let's just keep it as flat as possible. Okay, so we did not build up this excess capacity, right, which would have allowed us to accelerate the curve. Now, you're, I'm saying what? Accelerate the curve? Yeah, because when you are trying to deal with something like capacity utilization, there's always a trade-off. Do you want to have more capacity or less capacity? Do you want to have more throughput or less throughput? And of course, the answer is, right, you know, it depends. You have to think about the trade-offs. But for some reason, we got it into our heads that zero capacity utilization is somehow the optimal, right? Which ignores the trade-offs, okay? Ignores the trade-offs, okay? And there's a benefit to having, right, more capacity utilization, and there's a benefit to having less capacity utilization. And so the optimal capacity utilization has to be built on these trade-offs. When you only focus on one side of the trade-off and you ignore the other, then you're ultimately gonna make a suboptimal decision. Okay, 
Furthermore, uh, now the shelter in place was actually very effective. And it was what I found fascinating was that the, the legal impediments actually added very little. People voluntarily uh, adopted these uh, social distancing norms. Now, the question is, would they have persisted without legal constraint? I don't know. And I don't really, you know, it's an interesting economic issue, but I know how people get all bent out of shape about, you know, their rights and their liberties and stuff like that. That's something that an economist is not doesn't really have any comments on. Uh, it's, 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 you know, if this is uh, maximizing utility, economists will generally support it, okay? But uh, I think maybe we, we went a little too far and flattened the curve a little too much because we, we actually wound up in, in very, very few cases using up all the capacity. We actually found ourselves with lots of excess capacity in hospitals. Most of the people I know who worked in healthcare were furloughed for, you know, a good six months uh, during 2020. Uh, and so, you know, here in the greatest pandemic in our lifetime, most of the hospital, most of the doctors had nothing to do, at least here in California. Okay, we had lots of excess capacity for long periods and long stretches of time, you know, which later meant that they had, you know, minimal capacity. So if you're going to have minimal capacity in November, you know, you ought to use up some of that capacity in August, okay, so that you don't have to deal with uh, zero capacity like the San Joaquin Valley had. You know, in December, they should have been taking in more patients earlier in the year, which means taking your foot off the brake uh, earlier in, in the process. So what we saw is a dramatic reduction in emergency department visits. We saw a dramatic reduction in, in hospital visits, and that, that had some spillover effects, which could be good or could be bad. We don't know. But in order to really understand how to get the biggest bang for our social distancing buck, uh, you know, we need to look to marketing because marketing right now focuses on networks, networks of diffusion, networks of influence, right? How people, particularly in social media, influence each other. And so if you understand networks, and then you can understand which interventions are likely to have the biggest impact. This whole network science was not really brought to bear, I think, adequately in choosing which social distancing measures to use, because you can get a bigger bang for your buck with certain types of measures versus others. You know, blanket prohibitions on going to work or blanket prohibitions on leaving the house are not always the most cost effective. Okay. So, you know, here's, oh, I can't show this slide, but th these are some of the interventions and, and shows you how some were like super, super effective and, and some were not so effective in, in slowing the, the diffusion of the virus. But the, the other question I sort of had at this time was, right, um, why are we trying to keep, why are we trying to, uh, you know, expand, why are we, why are we so concerned about hospital capacity? It seems to be based on the assumption that access to hospitals improved your life expectancy. And at the time, there, there really wasn't that much evidence to suggest that it did. In 1918, everyone went to the hospital simply to die because there was nothing that they could do, okay? And in fact, there's evidence that going to the hospital, it creates a disease vector. So in, in Italy, uh, the, the province of Lombardy told their people, uh, come to the hospital if you feel sick. In Veneto, they told them, if you feel sick, stay at home. And what we found was a much bigger uh, surge in the coronavirus in Lombardy. Um, and so maybe what we should be doing is thinking about how to provide remote health care, right? Provide people with health care in their homes, not just telemedicine, but if you know, access to oxygen is what's important. Let's bring oxygen to people's homes. Now we've got a whole bunch of unemployed people that we could hire. And this is the other puzzling thing that I find about the coronavirus policies is that, you know, in World War II, we hired a lot of people to work in munitions factories. During coronavirus, we, we, just, we just gave people checks, right? Like why not put people to work uh, in, in healthcare, right? To actually improve patient outcomes. Right, invest resources in things which make a difference. Okay, so a lot of interesting evidence uh, that you know everyone was concerned about the ventilator constraint, and, and it turns out that that ventilators didn't really do a whole lot, at least initially, uh, compared to other alternative procedures. At least in terms of the massive cost differential, not only financial but also you know post treatment outcome. So these other instruments, these BPAPs, they cost very little. They, they can be administered at home uh, and they had uh, you know, fairly similar outcomes, much lower cost, much lower post-treatment uh, complications. Uh, and yet these things 
you know, because there was no clinical trial on them, uh, doctors were reluctant to use them. So, you know, another point that, I, that I, I'm really fascinated with is that when we talk, that to understand the sociology of science, you know, in statistics, we talk about, in data and decisions, we talk about, you know, hypothesis testing. And in the world of hypothesis testing, everything boils down to what is your null hypothesis and where is the burden of proof? In strategy, can you imagine if you had, if you use that rule, like, should Tesla, you know, should, should Elon Musk create an electric car? Well, there's never been an RCT on it. So no, we can't do it. You know, we got to wait until we do an RCT to discover whether to do an electric car. Can you imagine if Eisenhower had to do an RCT before invading Normandy? I mean, RCTs are the gold standard for, for the establishment of scientific truth, but they are not rules that you should follow in a crisis, particularly. You need to be able to go on the preponderance of the evidence and, and not on, you know, clear and convincing proof. Okay, so lots and lots of treatments were, were rejected by the medical community uh, because they failed to have clear and convincing proof. Uh, and the only way to get the clear and convincing proof is actually to have, you know, large scale usage and large scale usage requires clinical proof. So it's, 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 a, it's a catch 22 for lots of the different treatments and protocols that could have ameliorated the the, the, the consequences of COVID. Okay, so anyway, lots of interesting things here. And of course, vaccines, vaccines are, are you know, we, the, the idea of waiting for the vaccine, it's been amazing how we've been able to accelerate the arrival of this vaccine. But I think as of last March, uh, even the most optimistic people did not think we would get the vaccine as quickly as we did. If you look at how long it took to develop these other vaccines. So the purpose of the lockdown was really to, to buy time and in, in, in economics, we talk about real options. I've got a slide here, where's my real options? Real options. Real options means if you buy time, you need to use that time to acquire as much information that's relevant to decision-making as possible. We did not do that. We did not have a concentrated and centralized and resource endowed initiative to gather the kind of relevant information that we needed in order to adjust our decision-making on the go. We invested an enormous amount in vaccines, but we invested far less in other things which could have a high ROI, such as treatments, right? Such as ways of testing, right? And I'll get into testing if we have time, right? To prevent the, the dissemination, to understanding networks, to, to understanding what are the, in fact, are the risk factors, uh, which I'll get to if I have time, okay? So, you know, one of the things that I mentioned before, which I, I think was, you know, bizarre, we didn't consider this. If you look at smallpox, right, smallpox had something like a 30% fatality rate, and it went down to a 0% fatality rate after the arrival of the vaccine, cowpox vaccine. What most people don't realize is that there was an intermediate stage where the, the fatality rate went from 30% down to about 3% on its way to 0%, and that was through what's called variolation. Variolation was the exposure of vulnerable people to very, very small doses of the active virus, okay? Very, very small doses. And those small doses provoked the immune system in a way that made them resistant to the illness if they were exposed to it in larger doses, okay? This is called variolation. There were no clinical trials on variolation. There was no clinical trials whatsoever on variolation which to me is absolutely puzzling because if we could have reduced the IFR, you know, by a factor of 90% through this treatment, that would have been worth doing while we waited for the vaccine. So you can see, you know, why did this go down in the 1750s, uh, 50 years before the vaccine was introduced? It's because of what was called variolation, which was introduced into Europe by Lady Mary Montagu, right? From the Ottoman empire, very, very powerful treatment. Okay, so variolation is, is, is an alternative to, to vaccination. It was never even on the menu, which, which I find astonishing. Okay, now in data and decisions, right, we, we're trying to figure out, this is the other thing that they should have done in my view. I'm a da I do data science, I teach a course on data science. In that course on data science, whenever we want to come up with some kind of course of action, we want to know, right, what is going to give us the biggest bang for our buck. And so what we do is we create a spreadsheet with rows and columns. Right? And this tells us who we ought to lend money to, who we ought to advertise to, where we ought to like look for breaches in our security. 
Okay. And so if you want to know, right, who is most vulnerable and who is least vulnerable, then you can create a vulnerability index. If you have a vulnerability index, you can invest resources in protecting the most vulnerable. Okay. We did not create this in part because we don't have a good electronic medical record system in the US that allows us to go through and identify these things. And instead we have to do these things in a hodgepodge manner. So how dangerous was this disease? How much risk did you expose yourself to? Well, we know that 500,000 people died. Is this a lot or a little? Well, you know, I, I don't know. Smoking kills 500,000 people every year. So does that mean it's a lot? Does that mean it's a little? Um, it, it could be a lot, could be a little, okay? If it's a one-time thing, it's actually nothing compared to smoking, uh, which is very, very easily preventable. You don't need any fancy intervention scheme to get rid of smoking. It's, it's like a, you know, one piece of legislation and you're done. And then you've just saved, you know, 500,000 people a year, okay? Uh, but I think the thing with us is that, you know, smoking is, is sort of a, something we're used to and it's kind of gradual. And so there's a difference between what we call endemic diseases and epidemic diseases. And it's the difference between cars and planes. And psychologically, we're more afraid of plane crashes than we are afraid of car crashes, even though car crashes kill many more of us, okay? So, you know, when we look at the deaths, it's hard to really know how many people died of COVID because of, you know, death certificates and so forth. So that's why excess deaths is really the best metric. The problem with excess deaths, and again, I'm a data geek, is that it, it mixes up different causes of death. Did these people die because of infection? Did they die because of, um, you know, uh, failure to access healthcare for other ailments and so forth? Uh, so it's, it's, it's a fascinating number. It's going to be disentangled by the historians, okay? Uh, but, um, but I think it's, it's still the, probably the gold standard when we're trying to figure out what the, what the risk is. Okay, so we've been given a lot of numbers. They're very confusing. I, I would go into more if I could on the difference between the case fatality rate and the infection fatality rate. These used to be different numbers. We, we've kind of conflated them in this, in this crisis. So people talk about cases when they're really talking about infections. Okay, we don't talk about Epstein-Barr cases when someone's infected with Epstein-Barr. We only talk about it if they uh, present in the hospital with a, a case of Epstein-Barr, which usually means that they are probably over the age of 20 uh, when, they, when they become infected um, because the vast majority of humans have Epstein-Barr. The vast majority of us are exposed to herpes simplex. We don't talk about herpes simplex cases merely because you test positive on a PCR. Okay, so, so we've, we've had a linguistic confusion here, um, but we did have some pretty interesting numbers very early on in the crisis about what the IFR was, okay? And again, these numbers depend on the numerator and the denominator, but, but they're, they're um, you know, they, we had some good kind of insight into these numbers fairly early on. Now, okay, this is not animated, but when in my behavioral finance class, I ask people to assess their subjective probability of different risks. And I ask them, you know, are they more likely to be killed by a vending machine or a shark? And, and most people say shark, even though it's vending machine. Okay, so this tells us that our psychological attitude towards risk is not always supported by the data. So I asked my students, you know, what, if you're a female in your 30s and you've been infected with coronavirus, what is the probability that you are going to die? Okay, I want you to think about that. You're a female in your 30s you've tested positive for coronavirus, what is the probability you're gonna die? So my, my students said some, my students said 3%, you know, 2%, 1%, okay? They were off by a factor of, of, of 1,000, okay? A five factor of 1,000. In fact, your probability of dying of coronavirus if you're a female in your 30s without any complications or comorbidities is one in 10,000, one in 10,000, okay? Just to give you some sense of what that is like, you know, we're talking about, you know, you're, you're more likely to die on a motorcycle if you if you drive a motorcycle, okay? You're more likely to die uh, in a pedestrian accident. You're more likely to die of a gunshot than you are of coronavirus if you're infected. And of course, you may not get infected. So this this people, their subjective understanding of risk is so wildly out of alignment with, with the real risk. And a lot of it depends on, you know, political parties. But all members, everybody overestimates uh, 
not just Democrats, but Republicans overestimate the probability. So for instance, what are the chances of going to a hospital if you have COVID? Okay. Uh, of course, it depends on your age, but for a random person, the number is actually 1%. Okay, 1%. And uh, most people uh, are, are wildly overestimating the, the likelihood because we don't know how to assess probabilities and our public figures don't know how to communicate them. So I always thought, wouldn't it be great if you could just plug in a bunch of numbers and figure out what your risk is? And so what we know is that it's primarily due to age, okay? Okay, and age is the most important factor. So we're talking about, you know, a 9,000 times greater risk if, of death if you're 85 years old compared to, you know, 12 years old. 9,000, people don't understand how to deal with those numbers. It's, it's just so wild. But to give you an example, think about it like this. You know, if you have a peanut allergy, your probability of dying eating peanuts is radically different than if you don't have a peanut allergy. That's probably the way to think about it. Like if you are under 40, it's like having no peanut allergy. Like you can eat peanuts, it's not a big deal. If you are over 85, you need to worry about peanuts, okay? Radically, radically different risk levels, okay? So this shows you the risk based on age, okay? Death by age. And then you see stuff like this in the newspaper. And this is what, what drives people crazy is that like, you know, this, this kids are more likely to die, you know, falling off the jungle gym than, than getting COVID. And yet this is what we see in the, in the newspaper. So, you know, science tells us it's possible. It doesn't tell us that it's likely. So you've got to follow the science. Now, other things that will kill you, being a man will kill you, okay? So, you know, being a man automatically increases your risk for reasons that we, can get, we don't need to get into. And the color of your skin has a huge impact on your probability of, of surviving this pandemic, okay? Um, radically different, different outcomes depending on the color of your skin. And then all of these comorbidities, hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, kidney disease, dementia, okay, et cetera, okay? These things have a huge impact, all right? Obesity, we know, has a huge impact. Diabetes, massive, massive impact, okay? Uh, dementia, huge impact. It's estimated about 20% of the people who've died have dementia, okay? Massive increase in probability, okay? Psychiatric illnesses of all kind can lead to higher probability of death. And so this is increasingly making us aware of how inflammation it lies beneath a whole bunch of different uh, diseases in our society, okay? Um, you know, sleep deprivation. If you have trouble sleeping, if you are someone who is, uh, has disturbed sleep, you're, you're much more likely to, to die of COVID, okay? Massive differences. Uh, gum disease. If you have gum disease, you're nine times more likely to die, okay? So, you know, brushing your teeth is probably the best thing you can do if you want to survive this pandemic without a, without a vaccine. I don't recommend that. I recommend getting the vaccine, but you know, when the next pandemic comes along, the people with gum disease are gonna be the first to go, okay? So clean your teeth. Okay, nursing homes, it doesn't, you don't wanna be in a nursing home, not a good place to be, okay? Uh, prison, you don't wanna be in prison, not a great place to be for other reasons as well as danger to coronavirus. Smoking, probably not a good idea. Okay, um, air pollution, not good. Exercise, very good. People don't realize the impact. Now look, these things are, we haven't done clinical trials on all these because we don't have, we didn't have the, it's been going on for 14 months. This would have been a fantastic thing to do. Why don't we take people in the same place, run them through clinical trials where we have half people you know, on an exercise regime and half on a non-exercise regime and see if they have, uh, differential outcomes. Okay, we, we, we didn't do this. This should have been a great opportunity for funding research. And I mentioned viral load. Why did this doctor who discovered COVID in Wuhan, why was he dead of coronavirus? He was young, he was healthy, no comorbidities. It's because he was on the receiving end of massive quantities of viral load. Okay, so viral load is, is a huge, huge factor, which, which we don't, again, we don't talk about, uh, but it, 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 it matters. Okay, again, variolation could be a solution for the next pandemic. And then prior exposure is another thing that, that you know, 
people who studied the 1918 flu were, were you know, trying to figure out why it is that people in their 20s died more than people in their teen years. And then they, they realized that it had to do with, or at least there's a theory that it had to do with which flu strains they were exposed to in their youth, okay? The best way to protect your kid against COVID, apart from a vaccine, is to make sure your kid gets COVID, okay? That's probably the best thing you can do. If you didn't have a vaccine, you would wanna get your kid, figure out where the camp is, where the COVID's running rampant, and send your kid to that camp. Okay, that probably would have been my advice to you if we didn't have a, a vaccine, okay? Uh, and so there are all these other coronaviruses and exposure to them is not quite the same as exposure to this one, but there's plenty of evidence to suggest that it could potentially help. Again, why didn't we do a clinical trial on this, right? We do this all the time. I teach classes where we show how you can measure, uh, uh, you, you know, um, the impacts of stress by we, we blow coronavirus, we blow rhinoviruses and coronavirus up into people's noses in a laboratory setting. Okay. Why didn't we just do this? Give people, you know, the exposure to these other coronaviruses and then just let them uh, do their thing as, as a clinical trial. We, we could have done this. Okay. But we didn't. Okay. And so again, there's a lot of interesting things going on. I don't have time to get into, but there's a lot of evidence to suggest that this coronavirus is very similar to the others. And that if we did not develop a vaccine, it would simply become an annoying endemic kind of sniffle type uh, virus like all the other coronaviruses. It would be a one and done thing. And once everybody was exposed to it once, hopefully as a child, it would just bounce around as a relatively harmless thing. We don't know. We think it's more dangerous than the other coronaviruses, but we don't know. In order to find out, we would actually have to have people live in plastic bubbles until they're 85 and then expose them to these other four coronaviruses and then see if, if the outcome was the same, okay? So like chicken pox, like measles, exposure late in life for the first time can be fatal. Exposure as a child is, is, not, is just an annoyance. Okay, last thing I'll say, gosh, I have way, way more slides. I don't know what my, I have another hundred slides, but things that you can do to prevent coronavirus diffusion and death, which we should keep in mind for our next thing, right? Inside versus outside, okay? Outside, it's almost impossible to get coronavirus. You have to be standing very close to someone with no masks, but if you're out jogging, okay? If you're out jogging and you're on the trail in Marin, you're not gonna get coronavirus. Okay, yes, scientifically you could, you could, but you could get eaten by a mountain lion as well. All right, so when we see people here in Berkeley, I wear my mask when I'm outside, but not because I believe it has any impact on my health or the health of anyone else, particularly since I've had both doses of vaccine for months now, okay? But we, we still you know, have people wearing, wearing masks, okay? So um, one of the biggest challenges for Americans is that Americans don't spend enough time outside. And so when, the, the governmental, when, when we as a society decided to close parks last March, that was probably an absolutely horrible thing for us to do, to close off hiking and tell people to stay at home, absolutely horrible, in part because vitamin D has a very, very strong correlation with positive outcomes, okay? So vitamin D, again, we don't have clinical trials that give us definitive results because we haven't had the funding for it, right? But there's a lot of correlational evidence to suggest that vitamin D exposure can protect you from adverse effects of things like coronavirus. So what's the cost of taking vitamin D? It's like five cents a day, why not? Particularly, particularly if you have dark skin, okay? If you have dark skin, not just for coronavirus, but for numerous other ailments, right? People who have dark skin are experiencing much higher negative health outcomes in a wide range of ways, in part because of vitamin D deficiency. Now, so just to give you a sense, right? If you have, look at me, I'm as pale as they come. I can get outside for 10 minutes and I'm good to go on my vitamin D. If you have darker skin, you need at least hundred minutes. The average American does not spend hundred minutes outside, particularly if you live in like Minnesota or Vermont or someplace like that. So this is probably the single easiest healthcare intervention, cost-effective ROI of any healthcare intervention you could imagine. We spend 17% of GNP on healthcare 
this is like two cents a day that we could do to improve uh, healthcare outcomes. Okay, iron. Okay, so if we had good quality medical records, now the Mayo Clinic does and the Cleveland Clinic does, they went through and they looked through these medical records to see if there was any um, things that like other drugs that people were taking that correlated with a lower infection rate or better outcomes. And they actually found quite a few. One of one was melatonin. Okay, now melatonin is another thing which takes like two cents a day. And again, I'm not saying take this for COVID because you're gonna get your vaccine and you're, all, you're gonna be good. But there are other illnesses and, and pandemics down the road, okay? And so, you know, antidepressant usage. If you use antidepressants, you are much less likely to die of coronavirus in spite of the fact that you might be depressed, okay? Which we know is bad, okay? So fluvoxamine, fascinating story. Uh, a, a guy I know uh, championed this drug. Uh, absolutely dramatic, dramatic outcomes. Again, it's a generic drug, it costs pennies. And it's more effective, by, it's, it's 100 times more effective than a ventilator. Uh, and it, uh, is, it is, um, you know, extraordinary outcomes here. Okay, um, so masks, uh, this here we go, waste of time, stop posing off your groceries. Okay, it's not gonna do you any good. Instead, invest in ventilation. Our buildings are sick buildings, they're sealed. You know, I have a, I have a friend who is uh, at a university in the Midwest and uh, he was, because he was exposed to someone with COVID, they put him in the COVID dorm. You can't open the windows in the COVID dorm. Like what is going on here? Okay, have windows you can open, have ventilation, have filters, HEPA filters. Okay, these things are very effective. Fever checks are not. Now, the last thing I'll say, oh, wait, we're out of time, sorry. Are we out of time? No, I got a few more minutes. The last thing I'll say is testing. Testing is the single biggest missed opportunity, I think, in the entire coronavirus. We've been using PCRs. I've, I've got like 10 to, I, I must have had 15 to 20 PCR tests given here in the stadium since, uh, you know, since last year. Each one of those cost over 100 bucks to administer. Uh, and that doesn't even include paying for the people who are manning the, the, the gates and the security guards and all that kind of stuff. Antigen tests cost a couple dollars. Okay. Antigen tests cost a couple dollars. If at any one point during this pandemic, only 1% of the population was infectious. If that 1% knew they were infectious and were isolated, the other 99% could live as free as they were before the coronavirus hit. The reason why we locked down everybody is we don't know who has it. If we used rapid antigen tests on a daily basis, every single person, this would cost, you know, this would not cost a lot of money. This would cost about, $1.5 billion a day. So all 330 million Americans could, could basically take a rapid antigen test every single day. And if you test positive, stay at home. It's that simple. And the reason why we don't do this is because the testing regime was not designed for public health and it wasn't designed for pandemics. It was designed for you know, clinical purposes to discover what the root cause is of the symptoms that people present when they go to the hospital. It's not designed to prevent infections. It's not designed, it's just designed to answer a, you know, a trivia question that might direct treatment, but it doesn't have anything to do with the whole public health concern that we have, which is to impede the transmission of disease, okay? And so even though an antigen test is less accurate when it comes to identifying the presence of the virus in your blood, it, is, it answers the question we're interested in, which is, are you infectious? And even if it's less accurate than a PCR test, if you do it every day, as opposed to a PCR test that's done once a week or once a month, then at the end of the day, it's gonna wind up being more sensitive than the PCR test and it's gonna catch any infectiousness. Furthermore, right, there's a delay. PCR has like a three to three day delay. By the time you find out that you're infectious, you've already infected everybody, okay? So what's the point? There's no point, okay? You stay locked down during the test, waiting period and then when you get the test results you still can't go outside because you know you might have gotten infected while you were waiting so you got to do another one so what's the point it serves zero purpose okay so i can get into this but I, and i'm advising i have to disclose i'm advising a company but i uh, that does rapid testing and i'm doing that because i believe that this is an information problem so josh gans wrote a whole book on this and he says if we could move to a regime of rapid testing then we would be able to shut down this pandemic overnight. Now, 
we don't, do we need to worry about this right now? Probably not with the advent of vaccines, but you know, there'll be another pandemic down the road and we need to learn from this. Okay, so takeaways, we've got lots of takeaways. There's lots of things that we could invest in for the next pandemic that are around uncovering information and data so that we can have a better choice set, okay? Ultimately, when all the math is done, I think that we will discover that this pandemic has been, has been a disaster. The vaccine development is fantastic. We're probably gonna have a whole bunch of new vaccines for pretty much everything. I'm so excited about this. But when we look at some of the spillover effects of this pandemic that have nothing to do with the virus itself, but have to do with, right? Um, reduction in healthcare, education, you know, for every life we saved, we probably killed 10 people because if a shortening of lifespan equates to killing, every year of education that you lose reduces your lifespan. Every kid that has had been deprived of education this last year has is gonna experience a reduced life expectancy. We hope we can remediate this, but the data is not, not very good, okay? What we find is that one of the most important correlates of life expectancy is education. We see this in the international data Right? The reason why people are increasing their life expectancy is primarily because, or at least it's highly correlated with an increase in their educational attainment. Okay, uh, And so, so um, at the end of the day, if I had $8 trillion to spend on healthcare, if somebody handed me last March $8 trillion to spend on healthcare, I would certainly have spent a whole bunch of it on testing, a whole bunch of it on vaccines, probably at least as much as we spent on vaccines. But the, all of the, 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 the other trillions of dollars that I think we, we wasted, I would have pivoted and said, hey, look at HIV, much more serious problem than COVID, okay? Opioids, much more serious problem than COVID. And at the end of the day, smoking, much more serious problem than COVID. Diabetes, much more serious problem than COVID. So if we wanted to basically increase the number of lives saved with only a fraction of the expenditure, we could do so by banning cigarettes and banning soda. Those two interventions alone would save every year more lives than we will save this year and last year from the interventions around COVID. Okay, so again, I'm trying to be provocative. I'm trying to make you think about things in different ways. Here at Berkeley, we question the status quo. And so that's what I'm doing. Hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, let me know. If you want to continue the conversation after this session, I'm happy to, to continue it. Um, again, I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm just, a, I'm just one of these generalists who's, who's trying to make sense of the data by asking questions. So uh, feel free to ask some questions. Kevin, you want to ask them for me? Yes, there is one from Raj right here, and it's about um, mutations. Mutations are responsible yeah. for the ongoing outbreak right now we know in India, yeah. do you feel that we have a strategy to manage the risk of another substantial wave in the US outside of vaccinations to work against these variants? And secondly, do you feel that the developed world has an economic interest to subsidize containment efforts such as sharing excess vaccination supply? Well, I think we do have an economic interest, but even more, we have a human interest, right? I mean, we, we've, we've helped to eliminate smallpox. We're on our way to eliminating polio. You know, the, these, if you look at the, I just interviewed Charles Kenny, who's a development economist. The, the life expectancy increases that we've seen around the world in the last century. Remember, one out of five children died before the age of five, you know, earlier this century. I mean, we're, we're now one in 25. This is like such a dramatic increase. Actually, I think it was one in two. It was one in two people. 200 years ago, one in two people died before the age of five. Like we, we've made such a huge increase in human life expectancy and quality of life. We need to continue that. We need to subsidize vaccines in all these countries, but we also need to look at other things, right? So exposure to sunlight, you know, nutrition, exercise, right? We have all this dry tinder in this country because we are, we, are a hard, we are a super unhealthy country and the rest of the world is unhealthy too. And there are easy ways to fix this, right? There are easy ways to, to, to make us more resistant to these, to these, these, to these diseases uh, by reducing inflammation and, and other sorts of things. Um, so I would say, 
the, the, the variants mean that we have to continue to develop new types of vaccines. I think that we'll probably have some you know, over, overlapping immunity, but we also need to keep in mind these other, other interventions that can reduce the severity of the, of the, of the, of the, uh, of the illness and, and reduce transmissibility. But you know, we gotta be prepared to have coronavirus bouncing around with us, just like all the other coronaviruses and just like all the other influenzas. Uh, I think it's gonna be endemic uh, and it's going to continue to mutate, but hopefully it'll mutate in the direction of uh, greater transmissibility and not greater um, greater mortality. Great, and really quickly, Jin Wei does ask about, what do you think about vaccine passports? I know you mentioned them earlier, pros and cons of data like that. Um, well, you know, there, there's there's a logic to it, but at the end of the day, right? I think we need to get to the point. I mean, if we're not willing to ban cigarettes, like you know, like if people want to kill themselves, like you know, I guess maybe you know that's a, that's not that's a political thing. As a society, I think if we're trying to maximize utility, then you know, it's hard because somebody might get a utility because they think, oh, I don't want that chip in me or whatever. Like who knows, right? You got to deal with their utility. Uh, I think that. If most people are vaccinated, then they're pretty much resistant. Um, but you know, I think the danger, it's unlike, not like measles. Like you want to make parents inoculate their kids against measles because their kids have no choice. Whereas with this, it's pretty much harmless to children. So I'm not sure that we want to mandate that people give, give it to their kids. In terms of vaccine passports, I would love one right now because I want to travel. So I'd like to be able to prove, hey, I got a vaccine. Let me do what I want because I don't pose any danger to anybody. But ultimately, in equilibrium, I think we'll get to a point where there's people who aren't going to take the vaccines, and, and that means that they might get sick, but they're only going to pose danger to other people who don't take the vaccines. They're not going to pose a danger to the rest of us. So, you know, like if you want to smoke, if you want to drive a motorcycle, if you want to not take your vaccine, if there's no negative externality associated with it, apart from we probably have to bear your health care costs. You know, if we're, if we're going to make them do vaccines, we might as well make them do stop ban smoking, you know, like. Ban, ban soda, or at least tax the crap out of it. Maybe we could just have a tax. If you want to, if you don't want to take the vaccine, you got, you got to pay a tax. 